So letrozole in human reproduction, it is a very good drug for PCOS patients. You can use it in combination with gonadotrophins in ovarian stimulation for IUI. It is described uh, for IVF in poor responders because it makes the follicles more sensitive to FSH and you have a better response. In patients who cannot have a lot of estrogens in the system because they, are, they had a breast cancer, then you uh, use it for stimulation for fertility preservation, for example, if you want to freeze the oocytes. And we all know that the safety of aromatase inhibitors in ovulation induction is still discussed. This you know particularly here in India where letrozole is prohibited. So PCOS is a common cause for infertility that affects up to 5 to 10 percent of reproductive age women. If nothing helps, IVF XC is the last step of treatment modality for child desiring women with PCOS. PCOS patients are potential high responders to uh, stimulation and high responders have a higher risk to, for AHSS that we know. So the solution is that you should trigger with an agonist and freeze all embryos, especially in PCOS patients if you do IVF. So now, if you want to prepare the endometrium, you have your embryos all frozen. And then you have this PCOS patient who does not ovulate. But you want to prepare the endometrium right for, for uh, transfer. Then what they do in Shanghai is they give them 10 days something to let the patient bleed. Maybe uh, an oral contraceptive pill or an oral progesterone. And then from day three, of bleeding, they give them five milligrams letrozole for five days. So day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. Day eight, day nine, nothing. And then they do an ultrasound on day 10. If they find a follicle, then they track the follicle until these criteria are fulfilled. So the leading follicle should be more than 16, Endometrium should be more than 8 mm, estradiol should be more than 150, and you should see an LH rise. This is a very important signal for ovulation induction. If they don't see a follicle on day 10, they give 150 units HMG every other day from day 10. So day 10, day 12, day 14, for example, until they see the follicles and they uh, trigger the ovulation with HCG when these criteria are fulfilled. And then they thaw the embryos. Day 3 embryos, 104 to 108 hours after ovulation induction and blastocysts, 152 to 156 hours later. So again, they give the letrozole for five days from day three. Then on day 10, they do the ultrasound. If the leading follicle is there, they just track it. They don't give HMG. If the leading follicle is not there, they give 150 units every other day, two to three times. And this protocol is really good if you have a PCOS patient and you just want to make her ovulate with a single follicle. It seems that the pre-treatment with letrozole selected already the follicles, even if you don't see them here, and then you won't have a, a strong response, even if you go give them 150 units afterwards. Then they synchronize the embryo on the endometrium. Very interesting. If LH was less than 20 when they uh, trigger at 9 p.m. Then five days later they throw the D3 embryos in the morning and seven days later they throw the blastocyst to transfer them. If LH was already higher than 20, then they trigger 
uh, between 2 and 5 p.m. and they thaw the, the embryos one day earlier for the day three embryos four days later and for the blastocyst six days later. So these are the results. They had 501 cycles of frozen embryo transfers in PCOS patients, a clinical pregnancy rate of 51%, implantation rate of 36%, age was 31, and infertile years nearly four years. So the preparation normally took them 16 days. On trigger day, the estradiol was 333, endometrium was around 12. On, on embryo transfer day, uh, estradiol was lower, 93, progesterone was 16, and they transferred uh, two embryos. So as you can see, two-thirds of all cycles were monofollicular. They had only one follicle. In 20% there were two follicles and only in 6.83 and in 6.6 .6 more than three follicles. Here they compare the different groups according to the leading follicle number, endometrium, then the estradiol, the progesterone. It seems that the clinical pregnancy rate was higher when there were more than three follicles, but I have no idea if this is statistically significant. So in conclusion, in PCOS patients, the protocol of retrozole combined with HMG and induced ovulation in frozen embryo transfer cycles is a simple and feasible and satisfactory clinical outcome can be obtained. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I have another comment. Yes. Uh, it is very simple in certain cases of PCOS. I have had two patients where we had over 100 follicles. In such patients, how do you go about getting mono ovulation? Yeah, I would do the same actually. Um, maybe you can use anastrozole, right? In India, both letrozole and anastrozole are banned. So we can't even use letrozole or anastrozole. So how do you go about it? What, what I would do... <laughs> you see, the, the reason they are banned is, they say there are some congenital malformations. It is so stupid, all over the world is, it is being used. But we are forced not to use... I have had uh, two patients. In one patient, I have started stimulation with the uh, HMGs and then shifted to Professor Philly Corey's protocol of going to 200 IUHCG not to get uh, ovarian hyperstimulation. But unfortunately, I just got only germinal vesicles. So with over 100, you are so scared of ovarian hyperstimulation. It is so difficult even to stimulate, let alone bother about mono ovulation. How would you go about stimulating and be scared not getting an ovarian hyperstimulation? So because they just don't get stimulated at all, the undead. So if you cannot use aromatase inhibitors, these patients are extremely difficult to treat uh, for monofollicular response. So the solution that I would have for you in this case would be try a minimal stimulation, give her clomiphene, together with uh, HMG. Uh, let's say you start the clomiphene on day three and give her 150 units or whatever HMG in addition, and then you will have uh, maybe a hyper response. But yes, you can trigger What happens is you give minimal dose, no follicle gets stimulated unless you increase and then you have say 50, all of the 50 growing. The, that is the biggest problem in such patients. Um, even if you have 50 follicles, yeah. if you trigger with an agonist, you, you should not be scared about uh, hyperstimulation syndrome. If you trigger with decapeptil 01, you will not have a hyperstimulation No, syndrome. recently having cabaline, at least I'm not bothered about the ovarian hyperstimulation. I give cabaline for 0.5 milligram for eight days. That part I'm not bothered, but it is the getting the follicles up to the correct, the correct dosing part. So forget about the mono ovulation. Even to stimulate such hundred follicles, it is so damn difficult. 
uh, this is the second patient i will end it up with <laughs> i i i'm i it is really hard without aromatase inhibitors i don't know i cannot tell you any uh Long miracle long, solution. Very long stimulations. You know, we, we tend to we tend to get um, anxious because they're not stimulating very well and increase the dose. But if you keep them at low doses, you know, 75 units, even 37 and a half units, but stimulate them for 20 days instead of you know 11 days, they'll often they'll often start to recruit after you know the end, towards the end of those long. Yeah, days. one week uh, 75, and the next week 100, and the next week 150, and then. You know, this can go for months, and finally they they yeah, they explode. I know. <laughs> uh, Marcus, you said uh, that they have taken LH values. Yes. Uh, at at what time of the day have they drawn the blood sample for the LH? Because apparently it's a surge, and how do we guess? They uh, they look at day ten. At day ten, they they do the ultrasound and the blood test, and then their criteria actually to trigger is um, they want to see the LH rise. When you uh, give letrozole to these patients, then the LH is for some reason very low. And uh, if you see the rise from two to four, from one day or from one test to another, then this might already be the signal for, for triggering. But you have seen they, they, their threshold was 20. Yeah. So if they see 20, no problem. They, they uh, don't want to uh, do an egg retrieval or something where they really have to, um, to time. When the LH is 20, why do you have to give HCG then? I, I would not give, but they give. And, um, Maybe they give the HCG for some other reason, for uh, luteal support or whatever. I would not give it, but it, it seems to work, their protocol. They have good results. And, and one of your slides was shown by changing the Okay, um, they start their stimulation on day three. I'm talking about normal patients now, not PCOS patients. So day three, they start their stimulation, 150 or 225. It depends how much you want. And then uh, when you have the leading follicle, 40 millimeters, like the same way you would start your antagonist or fix on day seven, then they give 50 uh -huh. mi uh, milligram clomiphene and they give it all the way through together with the stimulation until they trigger with an agonist. Does it not, uh, interfere yes, it interferes, but they s freeze all. And once you can freeze all, uh, when you freeze all your embryos, you don't, you don't care about the endometrium. <laughs>